When we think of ghosts, most of us will think of stately manors, castles and graveyards, but in today's case, it is a small house, number 63 Wadley Road in Battersea, London, that was the location of a 12 year haunting that targeted a 15 year old girl as his plaything back in 1956. The Hitchens family, who lived in the house, were a seemingly ordinary working class unit. Dad Wally was in his 40s, a tall, thin London underground driver. His wife Kitty was an office clerk, and their daughter Shirley was a striking girl with dark hair and even darker eyes. Also living at the address was Shirley's grandmother Ethel, a fiery character known locally as Old Mother Hitchens, and her adopted son John, a surveyor in his 20s who Shirley thought of as a brother. I'm Bleaky, and in this video I will tell you the tale of the Batsy Poltergeist, a story of a spirit that communicates through letters, deafening sounds so that rival the sounds of the Blitz, and French royalty tied up in a 200 year old conspiracy theory. As a schoolgirl aged 15, Shirley Hitchens got up one morning and made her bed as usual. To her confusion, she discovered a lone key stuffed under a pillow. Her father Walter Hitchens then tried the key in every lock in the southwest London house but realised it didn't fit in any of the locks. That evening, they all went to bed as usual, but the entire family was awoken around 1 o'clock in the morning by the sound of deafening thumping on the ceiling. Bang, 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 bang. It was so bad that the neighbours on both sides called the police suspecting that something violent was happening next door. Now, the neighbours turning up may be a testament to how loud the bangs were, but here in the UK, I'll get neighbours banging on the wall when I watch Netflix like one decibel above mute, so... The disturbing activity only got worse in the days that followed. Kitty, the mother of the house, would go to do her housework, but as she moved from room to room, something else stayed behind, unseen. At night, the banging only got louder and louder. The front activity affected Shirley the worst, reducing to tears as she begged her dad, make it stop, make it stop. Feeling like he was letting his family down, all he could say in return was, I wish I could girl, I wish I could. The bangs continued to pound at the ceiling, rattling the foundations of the home. Shirley once said, I lived through the blitz and I remember the bombs dropping. It was the same level of noise. The sound was coming from the roots of the house. By the end of the first week of the activity, Walt had to give up his job as a train driver to look after the, uh, problem. Unfortunately, it wasn't a problem that Dad could fix. The banging continued for weeks. Only now, something had begun scratching within the furniture, the walls, and even the headboards of the beds. This, as you could probably understand, kept the family up for nights, leaving them sleep deprived and terrified every hour of the day. Neither the police nor the house surveyors could think of an explanation for the strange happenings. Several photographers and reporters were invited into the house to report on the activity and left soon after feeling unsettled and confused. As the weeks went on, activity within the house became more volatile and extreme. Multiple witnesses claimed to have seen slippers walking around on their own as if an invisible force was wearing them. Bed sheets were torn off the bed, chairs were dragged around the room and pots and pans were thrown violently against the wall. The most disturbing thing that happened, however, was Shirley being yanked around her bed and pushed around the room. Now it was clear, this wasn't just a natural occurrence, this was the act of a powerful poltergeist. Or worse. From around March 1956 onwards, the Hitchens family began to draw huge pressure tension in the UK. Remember, this was 20 years before the case of the Enfield haunting that was the focus of the Conjuring 2 movie. Photographers swarmed the house, while newspapers ran with the story that the poltergeist was romantically obsessed with Shirley, which is a bit weird as she was a 15 year old girl. Many people actually believed that the poltergeist was made up by the teenager and was stirred up by the girl for attention. The Daily Mail newspaper eventually got in contact with Shirley and invited her to the head office to tell her story. Disturbingly, the paper thought it was necessary to strip search the teenager just to make sure she wasn't hiding any devices that she could be using to create the paranormal activity, which is kind of awful. The paper published a sensational story of the haunting, which attracted worldwide attention. Even the BBC tried to muscle in on the publicity by trying to contact the poltergeist on primetime TV. The haunting was even discussed in the House of Commons. Word spread about the supernatural incidents, and within days, half of Fleet Street was camped outside the Hitchens' front door. That is when paranormal investigator Harold Chibbert turned up who worked as a tax inspector by day, telling the family that he knew exactly what they were going through and that he could help them get rid of the spirit. Or at least, you know, pay enough on their national insurance, I guess. 
Chibnit was well known and connected in the paranormal field, counting author Arthur Conan Doyle, psychic researcher Harry Price, and science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke as his friends. I bet his parties were wild. The first thing he told the family about Poltergeist is that it translates to noisy ghost in German, a description that certainly fitted the bill. Harold practically lived with the family after that. The case became one of the biggest of his life, and his extensive record was demonstrate that he full-heartedly believed in the Batsy Poltergeist. He spent days and nights recording events at the house, and eventually became a close family friend to the Hitchens. He even wrote a detailed book about the case, which was never published. Chibbit told the family that they had to strike up a conversation with the poltergeist, as you do. Eventually, they managed to get through to the spirit, which Kitty christened Donald, after Donald Duck. Trust a mum to give a cute name to an ominous evil entity rattling the foundations of the house. It kind of reminds me of a dog I used to have as a kid. As time went on, Donald's behaviour became increasingly violent. Rooms were found completely trashed, and spontaneous fires would break out. One of which was so bad that Wally had to go to hospital after suffering burns trying to put it out. Another unusual happening was writing that appeared on the walls, including the words Viva la France. Also, symbols of crosses and fleur de lis, a lily shaped decoration associated with French royalty, were also found on the walls. This was the first clue to Donald's true identity. Exorcisms were attempted but failed, which pointed to the entity not being demonic. The police would check upon the house as often as they could, but couldn't help the Hitchens family. Strangely, Donald circulated Christmas cards, leaving them around the house. It's gotta say something when a spirit can remember to send a Christmas card and I have to resort to text on Facebook on Christmas Day, but hey. Donald responded when Harold pointed to individual letters of the alphabet he'd laid out on the table. After a while, he realised that the words the poltergeist was spelling out were in a foreign language. Think Will's mom and Stranger Things, but less light bulbs. Eventually, they realised that the spirit was spelling out French words. Chibbert asked Donald if he was French, which resulted in an enormous bang on the table, which led the investigator to asking questions in French instead. In March 1956, through a letter written to Shirley, Donald wrote, Shirley, I come. From that moment on, Donald left notes all around the house ordering the family to do things such as dress Shirley in courtly clothes. Eventually, Donald revealed his true identity. So, if you were hoping that the spirit would in fact turn out to be an angry white duck wearing a sailor hat and coat, and suspiciously nothing underneath, you're going to be disappointed. In a handwritten letter written in May 1956, Donald identified himself as Louis Charles, the short-lived Louis XVII of France, who was rumoured to have escaped captivity during the French Revolution in 1795, rather than dying a prisoner aged 10 of Scrofula, also known as King's Evil, which we now know as tuberculous cervical lymphodentitis, tuberculous cervical lymphodentitis, tuberculous cervical lymphod... Screw it, it's called King's Evil. There are many that believe that the escape theory has been proven, although the apparent heart of Lou XVII is believed to have been kept in a crystal urn as a tradition. If the boy ruler did manage to escape, it does beg the question, whose heart has been kept preserved for the past 227 years? Donald, or Louis, used a number of elaborate French phrases in his letters and claimed that he had drowned on his journey to exile in England. Although this story is incredibly interesting, Donald did often change and contradict the tales through his messages. Bizarrely, Donald communicated through the bangs that he was infatuated with the actor Jeremy Spencer. In fact, Donald demanded that Shirley meet with Spencer or he threatened that he would cause the actor harm. Strangely, Spencer did suffer a non-fatal car accident shortly after the threat was made. Was this just a coincidence or was Donald up to no good? There are many who propose scientific explanations for the strange goings on at 63 Wycliffe Road. Some believe that the strange noises coming from the house was a result of the uneasy marshland the house was built upon, while others have suggested that acid in the soil could have let off fumes that caused hallucinations, which sounds like a hippie's dream in the 60s. Even the family cat Jeremy was analysed in a bid to come up with some more earthly explanation for Donald. Others accused Shirley of being responsible for the haunting, being a bored teenager who had manufactured Donald in an attempt to attract attention to herself and get gifts from being at the centre of all these disturbing events. Shirley was able to move out of the room she shared with her parents, was given money for clothes and fashionable hairstyles, and was the subject of much press hysteria. 
It sounds like being haunted in the 60s is the equivalent of being a content creator today, with just far less lip syncing to remix viral videos. So, was this just the fortunate side to the horrendous and relentless treatment from Donald, or was it manufactured to achieve a better life? Over the 12 years Donald decided to stay at the family home, three to 4,000 written messages were delivered to the family from the spirit, with an unbelievable 60 messages being left per day when the case was at its most popular. Maybe George R. R. Martin should hire Donald to help him finish Game of Thrones. It seems like the spirit could get more words on the paper than the author. Quite literally a ghostwriter. Oh no, he didn't. Supporting the theory that Shirley could be behind the hauntings, experts analysed many of the letters and concluded that it was possible that they were written by Shirley, but all in an intentionally altered style. It took a year before Donald started cooperating, but when he was angry, he would throw pots and pans out of the kitchen or take Kitty's treasured clock off the mantelpiece and drop it on the table. How many people does it take to unscrew a light bulb? Apparently one, as long as they're dead. This is something that Donald did a lot. Sadly, the hauntings went on for 12 years. When Shirley was married with a baby boy, Donald showed no sign of slowing down. She even got a job in Selfridges, but was let go because Donald caused so much chaos, stealing items from the store and hiding them. While it seemed life for Shirley would never be normal, suddenly, in 1968, Donald left a message for the family. Written in English, on the piece of paper that was left out for Donald to write on, the words, my work is done, were written. This was the last they ever heard from the fiendish spirit. So, it was either Donald had a lifetime or afterlife goal to work for Selfridges, you know, to organise the window displays or sell ridiculously overpriced items, or he had no more use for Shirley after she had outgrown her teenage years. There are many cases of poltergeists powering themselves up from young people, like a human battery, so this could be another example of this long-standing theory. When later interviewed, Shirley said, It's a wonder none of us suffered a nervous breakdown, but we were a very strong family, and I think that's what got us through it. For those interested in seeing the scene of the haunting, unfortunately the original house was demolished in the late 1960s and never replaced. This of course isn't a bad thing, just in case Donald ever decides to find another young teen to sap power from. Despite the horrible ordeal, the now 80 year old says she's not angry with Donald anymore, although she did say he did take away my teenage years and young adulthood, and I can't forgive him for that. Whether Donald was the twisted spirit of a child ruler, a mass hysteria, or the works of a mischievous teenager, the case of the Battersea Poltergeist continues to interest paranormal investigators and skeptics to this day. The Battersea Poltergeist case has gone on to be covered in all types of media, including podcasts and theatre shows. The Hollywood producers Bloomhouse also have their eyes set on the story, the production company behind Paranormal Activity, Insidious and The Purge. It will be interesting to see how much of the story they keep, embellish or just make up for the new TV show. Do you think the Bouncy Poltergeist case is worthy of a series? Drop me a comment and let me know. If you enjoyed this video and would like to watch more haunting and supernatural content, please make sure you hit the subscribe button and ring the notification bell. Until next time, sleep well friends.